Good evening, everybody. How is everyone this evening? Thank you for joining us in our virtual format and tuning into our live webinar. I'm Jill Miranda Baker, Executive Director of Florida Keys History and Discovery Center. Erin Muir, our membership and events manager, is joining in from her office. She is our event producer. We are pleased to offer you with another lecture, particularly on this topic, and welcoming Ryan back. We have reopened at the Keys History and Discovery Center with our normal hours, Wednesdays through Sundays, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., with necessary safety procedures in place. Our reliance on our volunteers to serve as docents and greeters to guests is greater than ever. Many of our regulars are back in their summer homes. And for others, it is unsafe to unnecessarily be around the general pub public. If it is safe for you and you are able, please consider volunteering. Our shifts are Wednesdays through Sundays, 10 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. and 1.30 to 5 p.m. If you'd like to learn more about volunteering, you can submit a volunteer interest form through our website at keysdiscovery.com, or you can just give us a call. Next Wednesday, July 15th, we continue our virtual program and we have Cocktails with the Curator, which is an open Q&A video session with Brad. This program does have limited capacity, so you do have to uh, register in advance. And you do that going to our website, keysdiscovery.com backslash virtual programs. On Wednesday, the July 22nd at 5 p.m., join us for Community Views, which is a narrated pictorial presentation uh, sharing photos of early days in Upper Keys communities. And this month's topic is going to be planter. Now to introduce our speaker, for those of you who do not know Ryan, he is a registered professional archeologist and PhD candidate in anthropology at the University of South Florida in Tampa. He has worked in private sector archeology span intermittently over the past 12 years, and he was a public archeologist at Flagler College in St. Augustine. Ryan has spent the last five years researching the archeology span of the Florida Keys for his doctor, doctoral degree. Ryan, welcome. Thanks for returning and coming back to us. Thank you very much for having me. All right, well, I wanna thank everybody for coming back a second time to hear more about archeology span in the Florida Keys. I know last time we got not off topic, but I started a little bit with islands across the globe and I'm going to do that again but I'm gonna drill down a little bit more into the Florida Keys and in, in, in particular, the Stock Island site with this presentation. So for those of you that saw the first presentation, some of this is going to be a little bit of recap, but I'm gonna do my best to talk about a bulk of new information as well. And so I hope that there's a little bit of something for the people who are watching this presentation for the first time and weren't here last month and for the people who saw last month's presentation and are just here for some new material. So without further ado, let's just jump in. I talked a little bit last time about why people chose to, to colonize islands in the first place. And of course, this is an important topic in the Florida Keys being islands. Um, there are push and pull factors that archaeologists like to talk about when it comes to island colonization. And when I say colonization, I don't mean people returning to islands after someone has been there. I mean specifically the first time that a group of people has ever come to a particular island or ever traveled there. And this can happen for any number of reasons. The push factors might be that people are pushed out by their culture or by their society because they lost a war or maybe it was even something small scale like a family disagreement that pushed these people into other places. An example of a pull factor might be that maybe the island has attractive resources. Maybe it has something for toolstone or um, an attractive subsistence resource something that brings people to this place or draws them in in a way because the island does not have the same resources as where they're currently living. And so when you think of push, you think of people being ousted from the mainland. And when you think of pull, you think they're actually drawn there for 
some set of circumstances. And so one of the most important factors in all of this is obviously if you're talking about a remote island, you're going to need a different or a certain set of technologies. And the number one thing you're going to need to get to an island is a boat. And so depending on where that island's located uh, across the globe, if you're in the South Pacific, it's going to require something very serious like sailing technology and a lot of navigational techniques. If you're in a place like South Florida and the Florida Keys, while you're still going to need some technologies, you're not going to need something quite as robust or serious because the distance you're traveling is, is much shorter. And so these are all factors that island archaeologists and people who study seafaring and, and study islands are going to take into consideration of just the technologies that people would have had to have had in place enable, that enabled them to make these journeys. And so I don't want to talk about that too, too much because we did hit on that last time. But what I do want to talk about is the Native Americans specifically in South Florida. And that's going to be the focus of the remainder of today's presentation. And maybe some of the Florida archaeologists would disagree with me who work in, in other areas, but I would argue that the South Florida natives were maritime people um, to a greater degree than were others. The, the people who lived in South Florida and the Florida Keys, they weren't farmers like people who lived farther north in the Panhandle and in north central Florida. They relied on the sea for, for pretty much all of their resources and they were the only habitats in South Florida, the Everglades, the Florida Bay, the Florida Coral Reef, where people really had to have a connection to the sea in a way that we just don't have evidence of in other places in the Southeast United States and in other places in Florida. So I would argue that the cultures in South Florida are not altogether unique, but they're at least unique in their own right. And when I talk about these peoples, especially for this presentation, we're talking about a group of people that archaeologists refer to as the Glades culture area. And what we mean by that, or the Glades tradition, and what we mean by that is a type of pottery that was made, a group of people who were interrelated biologically and culturally. We're talking about a time span. You see at the bottom right of the of the slideshow there, 500 BC to AD 760. So this is a group of interrelated peoples that existed for that number of years, over 1500 years, over 2000 years, really. Um, and so they were interconnected with groups that lived farther north in Florida. I have the examples up there of the Caloosahatchee and the Belglade cultures. The Caloosahatchee would ultimately become the Calusa. The Belglade would have become some other Native American groups that become known later in historic times. So all these groups are interrelated, but the Glades culture area really encompasses South Florida and its sort of unique adaptations that I was talking about earlier. All right, so for those of you that are unfamiliar, and many of you are, know the geography of South Florida and the Keys quite well. This is just a quick little map of the major islands in the Keys from Google Maps. And I'm just going to hit forward here and talk about some of the archaeological sites in the Keys. Now, one thing to really, really keep in mind, and I'm going to talk about this more in some forthcoming slides, and especially as I get into discussing the Stock Island site, is that many of these sites are, well, all of these sites are partially gone today. Many of them are 99 to 100% destroyed or buried or lost to development. Some of them are partially still intact and of course, these are just these are just approximate locations, and 
all of the islands of the Keys and many of the coasts of South Florida, all of these areas would have been inhabited by Native Americans. And so I don't want people to, to lose sight of that. These are perhaps just a snapshot of what once existed in South Florida and in the Keys. And it's maybe some of the larger sites that are remnants and that we still have a record of, no doubt. But I don't want folks to lose sight of the fact that sites were everywhere and people were living here for thousands and thousands of years. And so oftentimes in areas where we don't see sites, it doesn't mean that they didn't once exist. It, it just means they washed away because of currents or tides or development or um, any number of reasons. People picked up the artifacts um, that once denoted a site. So let's keep that in mind as we move forward. And these are just some of the places that we know that Native Americans lived. All right, the little box that pops up on the left, we're just gonna zoom in and we're gonna talk about the Stock Island site specifically. If you were in last month's presentation, you've already seen a few of these images. The, the Stock Island site there is located on the Northwest corner of today's Stock Island in between Key West and Stock Island proper along the Key Channel. And to your right there, I also have labeled the Boca Chica Channel. So this is, if you've been to Key West before or if you're extremely familiar with it, this serves as sort of a, a placement of where this site of Native American habitation was once located. Now, life at Stock Island would have been would have been similar to areas of the other keys, but perhaps a little bit different. You know, you're dealing with an island that's at the end of the archipelago, so you're the farthest distance from from land, or at least from the mainland in that case. And in whole, the keys are a different area of Florida, like I was alluding to earlier, because there's a negligible amount of potting clay for pottery, which would have been very, very important during the time periods that Native Americans occupied the Keys. There was a total lack, or at least nearly a total lack, of oyster shell that Native Americans throughout the rest of Florida, for the most part, at least those living near the coast, would have had for building mounds and, um, and, and for, for food, obviously, as well. What they replaced that with in the Keys, and I'm going to show this in a future slide because it's important to my research and it was important to their livelihood, is the the Kodakia shell, which is a bivalve clam that sort of replaced the oyster, which was used elsewhere in mainland Florida. But the other major takeaway here is that shell, these large gastropod shells that we see here, the marine snails, this was like the big three if you will, of what was important in Florida, not only for food, but just as important, if not more so, as, as a tool and as a resource that people used in place of hard stone. The lightning whelk at your top left, the queen conch at the bottom left, which is common throughout the Keys and throughout the Caribbean, and the Florida horse conch, because these shells were extremely durable and they could be used as a total shell, they could, be, they could be cut out and pieces of the shell could be used for scrapers, for knives, for punches, for axes or hammers. It really was limitless. These were the Swiss Army knives of, of this time period in Florida and especially in the Florida Keys. And so these, these replaced stone effectively as the hard material that was, that was abundantly available. As I just said, there were so few stone tools in the Keys. We do see chert, we do see flint, the material that Native Americans made spear points out of, but it's very, very rare. Um, it would have either taken down the line trading, people would have had to go a great distance for it. The chert analyses that have occurred in South Florida and all of these, mind you, are on the mainland. They're near Lake Okeechobee and in southwest Florida. When they've analyzed the materials that 
um, these stone stone materials at archaeological sites, they've found that most of them have actually come from near the Hillsborough River in the Tampa area. So any stone that comes to South Florida is coming from at least that distance in, ter in terms of chert or flint. And when we talk about the other stone tools, the ones that I have pictured here in the Florida Keys, um, we have pumice, which can float in from the volcanic islands in the Caribbean. It's so light that it can raft on, on different kinds of debris or um, in, in that way, it can, it can float in. Or um, we have limestone and we don't know. Limestone could come from some of the Caribbean islands. It, it may come from elsewhere farther north in Georgia or in northern places in Florida. But the major takeaway here is, again, the bottom line that all of these materials, for the most part, and the kind of limestone that's pictured here is, is different than the keystone that people are familiar with. All of these types of stone had to come from other, other places than the islands. And so it's, it really was a fragile ecosystem, and it was a difficult place to live. And so I think that should be one of the major takeaways and one of the themes of the Native Americans that lived here. All right, I wish I could show you incredible pictures of the Stock Island site, but I cannot. The, the last time that it was excavated was in 1991 and really 1990 by Bob Carr and his outfit out of, well, near Miami, Florida. Um, it's the site of the present day Monroe County Prison. And so the parking lot in between the two buildings here and of course, this, this is an image facing due south, nearly so. Anyway, um, the midden and the archeological site is directly beneath the parking lot and the prison. And so it might be preserved partially underneath the asphalt. Um, when Irving Eister excavated the site most recently in 1986, there was still some of the midden that was preserved and he suggested to the powers that be the developers that were originally going to develop a resort there a number of years ago uh, that never actually came to fruition, that perhaps they should leave a glass viewing area that exposed some of the archeological site. But apparently that development was scrapped and the city of Key West and the county eventually ended up purchasing the land and it, it sort of never came to fruition. And so when the county was going to construct the prison, Bob Carr came in uh, with his team of archeologists and they, they basically did salvage archeology, span which really, it only lasted a month or two. And it was attempting to get out as much material as rapidly as possible. And that's what I mean by salvage. They, they didn't have a lot of time before the development was going to ensue. And so it really was an all hands on deck. Let's get this stuff out of here. One of the letters that I, that I um, read about the site said that they had, in addition to all the things that were properly cataloged, they had an additional 200 black garbage bags full of, of the site, full of the midden and the trash excuse me, that had been left by the Native Americans there. So it gives you an idea of the scale of the site, even by the 1990s, of what was still present. And I'm gonna talk a lot more about that in the, in the upcoming slides. So this is, this is a testament to a lot of the things that have happened in the Keys over the years. There's so little land in the first place. And so what is there tends to be developed as most of you are all aware. And so the Stock Island site, even though it's one of the more or most, okay, I shouldn't say most, I'm biased, but uh, it's one of the more important sites in the Keys and its ultimate fate of being under a parking lot is not unique or, or even rare. And I'll just say at the top, if you're wondering before I move to the next slide, 8M02, that's the state designation for archeological sites. Eight stands for Florida in alphabetical order. 
F being the eighth letter in the alphabet. MO stands for Monroe County. And the number two at the end signifies that it was the second archeological site ever recorded in the county. And so any archeological site in the state has eight, an abbreviation for the county, and then the number. <clears throat> okay, even though, even though the site was destroyed, as I said, by the development of the prison, I still wanted to do my due diligence and see if there was anything left. So back in 2016, 2017, and, and actually I made some later trips there as well to go and check on things. I, I searched the island, what um, at least remained that was not developed. And I walked the edge of the mangroves. I admit I didn't actually get into the water, but I searched all over the place and I couldn't find any remnants of the site, unsurprisingly. I think that there is a chance that some of the Stock Island site remains. I think it's gonna be underneath the water. It's gonna be underneath high tide and low tide, um, if it exists at all. There have been archeologists that have, and geologists, who've searched for sites across Florida Bay and done deep coring um, into the sediment, searching for archeological sites. They haven't turned up a whole lot over the years and it's it's definitely difficult to do, but it's an area of research that's very much in its infancy. And so it doesn't mean that there aren't more archeological sites out there that are underwater and then sites that are like Stock Island that once existed on the edge of land and water. I know Irving Eister in some of his old field notes and his excavations at the Stock Island site had said that they could only dig certain levels and certain areas at low tide. And when it, when it came to high tide, everything was totally swamped because they were right on the edge of the island. And so um, that's important to keep in mind too. So I think that there are still intact archeological sites in the lower keys and places. Maybe they're not ones that are accessible on highway one per se, but uh, on the outlying islands and in other areas below the waterline, I think that there still could be remnants of sites, definitely. Okay, so on the topics that you know we've been looking at, how big really was the Stock Island site? And because it was destroyed so early, we can only make educated guesses. The last time that Eister was at the site in 1986, like I had mentioned, he measured it to be about 2,000 meters square. So if we translate that six to 7,000 feet squared, and which is, which is very, very large. Um, if we look at the keys as a whole, we know uh, as documented by early archeologists in the 1940s and 50s specifically, they documented shell and limestone mounds made from balls of keystone that they could be eight to 10 feet tall. And if we go back even farther into the historical record, in the 1820s, when Key West was being established, they talk of mounds that were up to 12 feet tall that were on Key West Island proper. And so these were not altogether small sites. Um, the trash mins, the deposits, the, the trash deposits, there's talk of it in the 1940s and 50s, many of these being longer than a football field being as wide or, or wider than a baseball field and up to six feet tall, just the trash piles themselves. And we can't lose sight that um, a lot of these trash piles, because there's so little natural soil in the Keys, it was taken just for, for garage fill, or pardon me, not garage fill, but for, for landscaping fill and for road fill. Um, because it was accessible and it, it was easy to get. And so it, it really was a detriment to archeological sites and, and in particular Native American sites in the Keys because it hampers our ability as archeologists to know the characteristics of these sites ultimately because so many of them 
as I've said a hundred times, I'll say it a hundred more, have been destroyed entirely or there's only a little bit that remains. And here's a little bit of a testament to that. This is a map from 1775 that was made by a British surveyor. And you can see here that the Stock Island site, which is your giant red dot there at the center, and Old Town Key West there at the bottom left. And I label that because I think that would have been the most habitable spot for Native Americans. Today we know that Old Town Key West is one of the highest elevations anywhere in the Keys. It's tied only by Winley Key. And so Native Americans would have been very, very well aware of that fact. And it would have been a haven during storms. It would have been a haven during times of, of king tides and just being dry all the time in the Florida Keys in times of any heavy downpour in the summer season would have been increasingly important. They would have been aware of that. There's other hypotheses that it wouldn't have mattered as much if they were on high ground or, or near the shoreline, either on the bay side or on the ocean side, because they could have constructed pole, uh, homes atop poles, which we've seen in other areas like the Miami area or at least it's hypothesized there also. Um, but personally, I think it would have been incredibly important to be on high ground in the Keys at all times, and the Native Americans would have been well aware of that. And so that's why I outline Old Town Key West there. And I think that there was also probably a bunch of Native American sites that once existed in that area that we just don't have record of today because it was also the airiest Areas, pardon me, <laughs> the earliest area to be developed. And so I think that's, again, a, a remnant or an artifact of the fragmented archaeological record. And if we move forward, about 70 years, this is another map that I showed during the previous presentation, but it speaks to my point, and I, th I think it's really important. This is why the Stock Island site survived. It's on this little itty-bitty island between Key West and, and Stock Island, and I think that afforded it some level of preservation that we didn't see on Stock Island proper or on Key West proper because it wasn't accessible as early on. It wasn't connected by Flagler's Railroad. It wasn't connected by the original Highway 1, and so people weren't as eager to search and to develop the area. And so, in a way, it preserved the Stock Island site for a very, very long time, and it's the reason that my research was even possible in the first place. I should have mentioned this earlier in the presentation, but all of my research, because the Stock Island site was paved over a long time ago, it was made possible by Eister and by Robert Carr's excavations because those materials were sent to the state of Florida and that's how I was able to access them and study them really for the first time since their excavations. And so it's these little happenstances of, of history that make research like this possible. And another thing to point out here is you'll notice that Key West and Stock Island are now two separate islands by the 1850s. And that wasn't the case, if I, pardon me while I jump back, we can see here Key West proper and Stock Island were almost connected. Maybe there was a little lagoon, excuse me, or a very small channel between, but it's grown much larger by the 1850s. And so at the time that Native Americans would have occupied this area, this was all one island. And even in early British surveyor books and the earlier Spanish, they probably would have just referred to it as one entire landmass. And so when they're talking about these places in the history documents and in the history books, Key West and Stock Island would have been one island or one place. They wouldn't have been separate until much later in much later in time until Americans were here. All right, and now if we 
if we fast forward to 1959, I just wanted to show a modern image. This one was also in the previous presentation, and I like it quite a bit because it actually shows the location of the Stock Island Midden. It's a little blip there, a little, um, what looks to be a vacant area. And I'm not sure precisely why that's there, but you can see that in 1959, it looks like there was a little road out to the outlying island, but not, not much of one. And we can already see that the golf course is in place on the north side of Stock Island and some, well, many of the modern features of the landscape today. But it is nice to see as late as the 1950s that there is some photographic evidence of the Stock Island site. Okay, so let's talk about some of the characteristics of the site itself in terms of time and, and what we actually found there. When the Stock Island site was originally settled, this isn't totally understood yet. I have several radiocarbon dates from the site. We have pottery styles that have dates on mainland Florida and, S and elsewhere in the Florida Keys. So we have this 400 year time span that we hope to sort of pare down over, over the next year, let's say. But as early as AD 500 and perhaps as late as 8900, but either way, we're looking at a period of time of you know, 1500 to about a thousand years ago that this site was settled. Now, this doesn't mean that Key West was settled at that time, or these were the first people that ever came to this area. This is just the earliest record we have at the Stock Island site specifically. There could have been an earlier site on Key West or somewhere else in the area that was developed or succumbed, had succumbed to sea level rise or some other situation. But as far as we know, and what we can say specifically about Stock Island is that it was settled at least as early or as late as 8,500 to 900. And again, we hope that we'll be able to pare that down quite a bit more in, in future years. I'm actually in the process of sending off for more radiocarbon dates this week and next week. And so fingers crossed in about a month, we might have new information. And in terms of discovering whether there are older sites in the area, we do have a method to do that as well. And I'll talk about that in a future slide. All right, so let's talk about what Native Americans were eating at the site. As I said earlier, in South Florida, what's unique is you have people having a strict reliance upon the freshwater and estuarine and marine species and not farming. And so there's an incredible reliance upon both, both land and sea creatures that they're, that they're hunting. And so that's very, very different from what's going up farther north, going on up farther north. The terrestrial animals that they're eating primarily at Stock Island and in the remainder of the Keys are key deer, obviously, and especially in the lower Keys. For whatever circumstantial reasons, key deer were more prevalent in the middle and lower Keys, and that was true in Native American times as well. And so obviously these deer would have been incredibly important sources of protein and food in terms of land-based or terrestrial resources. And not only for the food, but these were also their long bones and their legs were turned into many different types of tools. They were as important as the shell um, in many cases, and certainly throughout the Everglades and in other places in South Florida, the, the key deer was, was very, very crucial. And so at the Stock Island site, there's a lot of their bones that are left over, both as tools and both as simple subsistence resources. It's no coincidence that there's also some little white herons there in, in the photograph because bird bones, and it looks like there's a roseate spoonbill on the right-hand side, that 
were also very, very common to the middens at or the midden at Stock Island. Burrs were another incredible and important subsistence resource throughout the Keys. I wonder if it would have been as easy back then to shoot them as it would be today because they don't fear people because many of them were protected. Um, but I still think it would have been relatively easy for a Native American to harvest most of the birds that, that we still see today. Other smaller ground critters, I mean, we do have mouse and rat bones at the Stock Island site. We have raccoon and possum, but I think these were eat, eaten to a lesser extent. And that's what our research is demonstrating so far. By far, a, a more important subsistence resource would have been anything that came from the sea, especially being in the Keys. Um, I wrote a list here because I want to tell you about as many of the marine resources as I can in the Keys because there's so many unique habitats between Florida Bay and the Coral Reef that no other Native American in Florida was really fishing uh, for other than those people that lived in the Keys. I pictured here a sailfish. We have sailfish vertebra at the Stock Island site, which is absolutely incredible because you can't spear a sailfish, um, which is how most fish and other resources in coastal areas were, were harvested. Um, our best hypothesis, and we're not sure of this, is that they used hook and line to get sailfish because they're, they're pelagic or pelagic species. They live in the open sea and in the open ocean and they're very fast and they fight very hard. So you can imagine a Native American on a, on a hook and line, maybe by hand, trying to bring in one of these animals, but, but they did so. And so that's incredible. Um, we have Goliath grouper vertebra in the Stock Island Midden as well. Um, these animals, as, as many of you know, live in the nooks and crannies of the Florida Coral Reef. And so, and Native Americans in this area were excellent divers. Perhaps they could have speared those, but again, um, we're not entirely sure how they harvested these animals. Um, sharks. Sharks were huge um, in terms of their meat weight and, and their caloric return that they could have given to the Native Americans in the Keys. So we have lots of shark teeth, lots of shark vertebra. Um, we have lots of vertebra that are so small that they came from nursery size shark. And so what we think was happening there is they were being netted in in Florida Bay and in the shallow seas and the shallow seagrass flats of the ocean side of the Florida Keys. Uh, if you're wondering about Keys lobster, we've got the season just around the corner. We think that they ate a lot of Keys lobster. Those would have been obviously fairly easy to get, um, but, <clears throat> excuse me, the problem for archeologists is lobster doesn't preserve. There's not very many hard parts in a Keys lobster. And so while we think they ate quite a few of them, they don't show up in the trash pile or the midden in the same way that a lot of these other animals do. Other exceptional animals include the monk seal, the Caribbean, Caribbean monk seal that went extinct as far as we know in 1952, was last seen off the coast of Nicaragua. But the historical documents indicate that this was another important animal in, in Keys natives' diets. We have other historical records, and I'm gonna talk more about these in upcoming slides, but we have other historical records of people hunting, seasonally migrating right whales. They came down the Atlantic coast every single year. Uh, they, they still do. And there's incredible accounts of natives leaping onto the backs of these whales and shoving spears into their blowholes blow and then bringing them back ashore. And we do have evident, evidence, we have bones from whales at the Stock Island site. So we know that this practice was going on in the Keys as well, even though it was never documented historically in the Keys, only in the Miami area. That was just because we didn't have any long-term Spanish folks living there to write about it. But we have archeological evidence that it did occur. Another species 
or group of species rather, genus or family that exists in the Florida Keys is obviously sea turtles. What's interesting about Stock Island is to my knowledge, there's only one other site, Watson's Hammock in the Lower Keys on Big Pine Key, and then the Stock Island site, they have the largest proportion of sea turtle remains of any sites in the Florida Keys and any site in all of Florida. I think this is just because they were very, very accessible. You think about the naming of dry tortugas in the westernmost lower keys. Spanish called them that for a reason. They had all this documentation that they were pulling them up by the dozen um, in the 16th century. And so I think the proximity to the tortugas and just the natural habitat that was available in the lower keys for many different species of sea turtle um, made them abundant and easy to get for the Native Americans. And so I think that's why we see such a, a large number of sea turtle bones at the Stock Island site. I have a barracuda picture there as well. I've got a lot of remains of barracuda, which again is, is not that surprising. It's a very abundant species in the Keys and people still fish and catch them today. So it should come as no surprise that this was an important food source for Native Americans as well. As I've alluded to, this was another similar slide that was in, in the previous presentation, but of course these Native Americans weren't just eating the animals, they were also using whatever remnants they could for tools and sometimes that factored into their decision on what animals they were going to hunt if they could sort of get a two for one. And so I have some examples here of a queen conch shell. We can see the rectangle removed there for a purpose we're not sure of. The tiger leucine that we're looking at near the, be or not the beginning, near the middle of the slide that has a hole punched through it. What we think is happening there is it's actually a net sinker that they would have strung along the bottom of a net uh, to trap fish. If they had an entire strand of those, the shark's teeth on the top left, the tiger shark, the lemon shark that have the drill holes, these could have been used as tools, these could have been used as jewelry items. I think I alluded to that in the previous presentation. Um, we have the ax heads, we have the whelk pendant there also at the bottom center, and then an example of a lightning whelk hammer. And I'm going to show I'm going to show a few more of these in, in forthcoming slides, but this is just a very small sample. I wish I had a lot more time to show other tools that we find at the Stock Island site, but this is a good snapshot of what a toolkit would have looked like for a Native American living in the Keys. And as you see, a predominance of shell and of animal, re animal remains, pardon me, because again, that lack of stone, using what was locally available. These are some of the ceramic styles that we see in the Florida Keys. This is an adaptation of a previous style. All of these are specifically from the Stock Island site. You'll see they have different designs. Some of them have just that treatment on the rim of the pot, the glades tooled at the bottom. You see the Key Largo incised on the top right, which was an earlier design that has sort of the wavy arches near the top of the rim. And then you see the surf side incised on the top left, which actually into the rim, it has a little wavy cut design. And so all of these are different markers of different time periods in the Florida Keys and throughout the rest of South Florida. And so we use these in conjunction with radiocarbon dates to understand when a site was occupied, perhaps get a little insight into the culture. We don't always know what the incisions or the patterns mean on the sherds, uh, the little pieces of, of ceramic, but it does tie together groups of cultures because they were practicing similar pottery styles and pottery artwork. And so it tells us at least that they're related in some way. And so this is very big in the keys where other than the shell remains and some of the other food remains, it gives us another piece to look at their culture. 
All right, so what I'm looking at at the Stock Island site, I'm gonna go over now a couple of the major questions that we're asking. And some of them are simple, and some of them are a little more complex or a little more difficult to answer. But one of the fundamental things we're looking at, and I've talked about this in previous presentations, is seasons of habitation. And this is really important in the Keys because we don't know the simple answer to whether prehistorically, before Europeans arrived, we don't know if people were living in towns or villages year round on islands in the Keys, or if they were just using them as fishing hubs or, or fishing or ritual areas partly or during a certain times of the year. And so to address some of those questions, I'm gonna sample several midden shells for season of collection from two different time periods. And, the, and that's what's written at the very bottom of the page there at the bottom of the slide. Before Europeans, there between AD 600 and 1000, and after Europeans arrived, after 1492 and into 1700 when natives were still occupying the Keys part of the time. And this is crucial because when Europeans arrived, it obviously upended cultural practices for all South Florida natives. And so we can't always look at what the Spanish wrote about Native Americans and what was happening during the 16th century because it probably changed as a result of interactions with the Europeans. So this is a way to get at what the lifestyles and the lifeways were like prior to European arrival and after European arrival, because we've got folks here like Johnny Depp, Pirates of the Caribbean, that showed up and obviously changed everything in their search for treasure and their desire desire for rum. And actually, it's a joke. This, this image here is from when in the first Pirates of the Caribbean film, he was shouting, why is the rum gone? But that's actually apropos for the Florida Keys as well, and even for the Native Americans, because the first Spanish wanted the Native Americans to transition to Christianity, and they used rum as the bargaining chip. And so there's some incredible historical documents that talk about the Native Americans wanting rum in exchange for, oh, we'll convert to Christianity if you, if you give us something to drink, and then, you know, saying, oh, no, never mind, I forgot, or no, I'm not interested in that until you give us, until you give us more food and more rum. And so it really did upend all the patterns of Native American life when Europeans arrived. And so that's why it's so crucial to look at the time periods before and after Europeans arrived. <clears throat> and so to do that, again, I, I talked about this in the first presentation a little bit, but we're looking at some clamshells to determine the season that they were collected, and then by extension, the season that Native Americans were inhabiting the site. Because Key West, Stock Island, it's pretty far from the mainland. And so we're confident if people were coming down all the way to Key West and harvesting these clamshells among all the other subsistence resources that they would have been staying there for a significant length of time of, of any given season of the year. And so we've heard of dendrochronology. I use this analogy often which is tree ring dating and looking at weather patterns from tree rings. If a tree ring is wider than, than the others surrounding it, it might indicate a wet year. If it's very, very narrow, it might indicate a dry year. And you can look at those patterns over time on a tree and evaluate and ascertain how old the tree is, but also a little bit about the climate. And so sclerochronology is doing the same thing with seashells. And in this case, we're looking at the clams that were eaten by the Native Americans. And now we're pairing the growth lines that are along the shell, which you can kind of see there in the image as little concentric rings that grow from the top of the shell all the way down to the shell edge at the bottom. And we're pairing it with a chemistry method 
that looks at the oxygen ratio in the shell. And to make that very, very simple, the oxygen ratio, oxygen isotope ratio in the shell is a function of the water that the shell was growing in. And oxygen is most closely related to temperature and salinity. And so when we look at this graph and all the gray dots, if we start on our left-hand side and we go to our right-hand side, we see an up and down seasonal trend. And the uppermost dots, as we see, are labeled summer. The bottommost dots are labeled winter. And so these are annual cycles that the shell was growing uh, during. And so wherever that cycle ends is the time of year that the shell was collected. And so we see at the right hand side of the screen here, that's during a winter pattern, that's during a low. You can see the little gray dots are moving towards the bottom of what would be uh, the annual cycle. And so, and that matches because this was a shell that I collected um, in the Keys in 2017 during December. And so that fits that that water temperature would be the coldest. And so when you look at this big cyclical line, you're really looking at water temperature. And so it's not surprising since I picked up this shell in December that it's on a cooling trend there at, at the end on the right hand side. Okay, so let's look at a couple other questions with regard to the Stock Island site. But another big one is, well, where did the people come from? originally who settled the site? We don't know yet, and we're going to be working on that question for the next several years at least. But one similarity that the Stock Island site has with another area of mainland Florida is in the 10,000 Islands. There's a group of ceramics and pot uh, pottery vessels that were crafted in the 10,000 Islands for several hundred years between AD 500 and AD 750. Disproportionately, the number of ceramic vessels that we find at Stock Island, or at least the pieces of them in the earliest context, all match that style that was most widely available in the 10,000 Islands. So this is a very tentative hypothesis because these ceramic styles are found elsewhere throughout South Florida. It just so happens that they're found most frequently and in the highest densities in the 10,000 Islands area. And then the earliest deposits at Stock Island also have high densities of the same types. And so here is my three yellow arrows that indicate a way that the keys, or pardon me, that Stock Island could have been first settled or the first settlement that we have a record of. It's only a 25 mile distance in between Flamingo and the eastern side of Marathon or Kibaka or Baca Key. So it's, it's not a stretch and they could have hugged the coastline. This is a very believable path that Native Americans could have taken to Key West. In the future, I don't know if I'm gonna have time to do it over the course of my doctoral research, but people have very, very advanced techniques for analyzing pottery these days that look at the various chemicals and elements, the composition of the clay that the pottery was made from. And so if we get a sample from various places in South Florida and clay samples from perhaps in the Upper Keys, we can compare the chemical signature of clay deposits in those areas to the pottery that we're seeing at Stock Island and see whether it matches. And so this will give us insight in the future into at least where people were coming from and perhaps maybe who, would, who they were related to. Um, we can't say for sure what culture or what tribe because people could have been trading ceramics or any number of other things, but if we know the source of where the clay was coming from, at, at least gives us further insight into the trade networks or into the movement of people in South Florida. Okay, another question that always comes up is, were people that lived in the Keys 
Calusa or Tequesta or Matacumbe. And it's very, very complicated. But to summarize rather quickly, the Calusa, Tequesta, and Matacumbe were names that came out of the arrival of the Spanish, right? These are the names that they called the Native Americans that they saw when they got off the ships or when they were shipwrecked or something like this. And so we don't know what the Native Americans called themselves prior to the arrival of the Spanish because they had no writing system. And so we're left to interpret the Spanish historical record with regard to what the natives might have referred to themselves as. Um, when it comes to the Stock Island peoples, they were related to all of the above. They would have been related to the Calusa, related to the Tequesta, and to the Matacumbe. Um, the Spanish name that's given for the island of Key West is Cuchiaga. We know that from, from numerous Spanish historical documents. And so that would have been the name of the chief of the town of the people of Key West during the 16th century. Prior to that, we're not really sure because Native Americans in South Florida and in other places, as far as we know, followed an ascribed status form of leadership such that the chief or the ruling person gained that status by birthright. And so the chief or the chief's son or chief's daughter would have gained that that power and that control because their father or mother was, was in control. And so if we reach back in time, we don't know prior chief's names prior to Spanish arrival. And so we don't know what the Native Americans 1,000 years ago or 1,500 years ago would have called themselves, but it was probably something different. And so it was an evolution of different names. And the names that we're left with today, like Calusa, are the ones that are just the earliest documentation that we have. And the Chiefdoms in the Keys is alludes to another big question that we have, and that relates to that seasonality question that I had earlier. We're not yet sure, did we have established chiefdoms in the Keys prior to the 16th century? By then, the natives, or pardon me, the Spanish were writing about it. And so we're certain that they had at least semi-permanent villages in the Keys, and they had established populations and lineages of important people by that time. But in the past, we're not sure. And that's why we have to do the seasonality assessment to see if people were there year round and why we have to look at the pottery and other pieces of the archeological record to piece together whether it looks like there were long-term folks living in the Keys and permanent villages on any of the islands in prehistory, long before Europeans ever got, got to the islands. And so I see once again, I'm, I'm talking a lot and going over time, but I've alluded to these figures in previous presentations. When we get a lot of the information, Juan Ponce de Leon, Pedro Menendez de Aviles, the settler and founder and governor of St. Augustine originally, this is where a lot of our records come from. Are, are these two individuals? And um, for Florida Keys, ethno history, writing about cultures of the Keys, our two big names are Hernando de Escalante Fontaneda and Juan Lopez de Velasco. They were in the Keys, well, Fontaneda from 1549 to 1569, so far as we know. And Lopez de Velasco interacted with him in Spain shortly thereafter and also spent a lot of time in the Florida Keys. And so they wrote down the names of towns and they wrote down what they were fishing for, what their dress was like, what they were eating, what their politics were at the time and the important chiefs that I was just alluding to. And so from this, not mountain, but from this good bulk of information that they had written about, we have some estimated locations of some of the Native American villages. Um, Cuchiaga, as I said, I think personally that the Stock Island site is a remnant of 
of that village. It has all the hallmarks. It has Spanish material. It has British material. It has an abundance of Native American material like we've talked about over the course of the presentation. Um, Garangumbe or Matacumbe, I think was the same village and was a Spanish name that changed over time, maybe even following a change in the chief because we have different names showing up based on the timing and the Spanish person that was writing about it. And I think the Matacumbe village moved farther south as we moved farther in time, as we move forward in time. So I think originally the bigger village in the Keys was located on Key Largo, and then I think it moved down to what is today Lower and Upper Matacumbe. I think it, that happened later in time in European times. Um, Tatesta was another village that is mentioned in a couple different documents, and um, we don't know its exact location. I put it on Sugarloaf just because there was a really, really big site there once, and it did have Spanish artifacts, but the jury's still out on that one. One thing I didn't talk about yet, and I'll try to, to wrap up here, I know I'm over time, but I didn't talk about population. The Spanish did write the population of some of these towns, and they ranged in the Keys between 1,000 people all the way down to Cuchiaga. They said it could have been 40 persons in, in one document. So we're talking of a range from about 50 people to all the way up to 1,000. And Again, we don't know how far back that stretches in time. Um, if the populations would have been bigger in prehistory or smaller, we know they, they got rapidly smaller once old world diseases took hold um, in the Keys and throughout the New World. But we're not sure exactly how the 16th century data that the Spanish wrote down correlates with the earlier time periods. We, we have to go off of inference. Okay, I'll say just a word. We do have, I wanted to show you some archeology span pictures. This is in the tie-dye shirt, Professor Tracy Ardren from Miami. She's working on a site in Key Largo that I've also been helping out on. That's a little excavation unit, the square. You see Jesse there, got his face down, looking into it on the right in the bucket. We see this is what some of the tools look like. Those are lightning locks. We see the holes punctured there in the sides. That would have been where wooden handles were attached at one time. And so this is the kind of stuff that we see at archeological sites in, in the Keys. And so I can hopefully talk more about future research, um, maybe in a forthcoming presentation of what's possible in the future in the Keys. Because even though a lot of sites have been destroyed, I think we still have a lot to learn. And there's a lot of positives that are gonna come out of Keys archeology span in the future. And here's a photo of me working at that same site. You can see I'm on the shoreline in Key Largo on the, on the bay side, thick in the mangroves. My, my advisor, one of my advisors, Tracy, she made the joke that it looks like Ryan's really deep in thought thinking about archeology span in this photo, but I think I was probably just thinking about what was for dinner. I, I don't know that it was altogether a deep archeological thought, but we'll never know because I didn't actually know that she was taking that picture when she did. But um, this is the kind of environments that we work in. And if you're wondering, we usually do these in November, December, January, because the mosquitoes won't carry us away at, at that time of year. Future research, as I said, at Stock Island is we're gonna get more radiocarbon dates. We're gonna test more midden shells. We hope to do charcoal and pollen analyses, more pottery stuff. I hope that I can dig on, on Key West one day. It's gonna be difficult because most of the islands paved over, but maybe some private residences in the future that still have intact land. I hope we can learn more about the cultures on Key West and Stock Island specifically in that way. So we'll, we'll see what happens in the future there, but I'm optimistic. I showed this in the previous presentation also that I want to get a historical marker sign on the northeast, northeast end of Key West um, that looks like what you see on the left side of the screen. I'll pave it over there with Stock Island Archaeological Site. 
so people know that it was once there. Um, and I hope that in the Key West Custom House, and I've even talked with Brad about hopefully getting some Native American artifacts, uh, some additional ones, into the museums in the Keys, the Florida Keys History and Discovery Center. Um, so current and future people can appreciate the excellent Native American history that we have in the Keys because I think that it's really important and I think that a lot of people would really, really enjoy it. And so that's gonna be an ongoing goal for many years in the future. And with that, I, I thank you very much. Thank you for that wonderful presentation, Ryan. This is Aaron Muir and I'm going to be facilitating our question and answer segment here. All right, let's go ahead and get started here. I see we have a question that Mary Jo has typed in. Mary Jo would like to know, have any of the ancient pottery pieces ever been discovered back in Spain, which could indicate interaction with Keys natives? Well, yes and no. During the European period, during the first Spanish period in Florida, we see an influx of pottery types that would have been familiar to Spaniards, most of which were crafted in Mexico and in some places in the Caribbean. And so we do have European style ceramics like olive jar and majolica and other pieces that are present in Stock Island that indicate either A, the Native Americans had obtained them after the Spanish had arrived, or maybe that Europeans themselves were present or that these items had been traded in. There's always two or three or four different ways that those items could make their way to a site. So yes and no, we don't have any, to my knowledge, any prehistoric Native American things that made their way to Spain, but Native Americans were taken to Spain during the 16th century. So it's always possible that they could have taken some of their own artifacts with them. All right, so now we have a question that was submitted by Bruce Levy, who would like to know, how did the Native Americans communicate with each other to travel down together to Key West? That's, an, that's a really good question, and I don't have a good answer for you. I would just say that Native Americans had been living in South Florida for thousands of years, and so I think all of these groups probably interacted very, very frequently and made trips to various towns and different islands with each other and were in constant communication with each other. And so I think it would have been a word of mouth sort of thing. The Native Americans were using the Everglades as a conduit between the West and the East Coast and most certainly could have traversed Florida Bay from a very early time on. And so I think that it was just sort of down the line, village communication and exploration communication that the people would have used to talk about the more remote sites. And then, you know, word travels fast uh, among different people. So it, I think it would have been a quick process that they would have known about Key West and the other islands in that area. All right, so David Godfrey would like to know what species of whale remains have been collected from Keys sites? The only species that I know of is from the Stock Island site and that's pygmy sperm whale. And I don't know if that's an isolated case or if that exists at other key sites. There's not a good faunal record at a lot of the key sites or it's never been studied intensively yet. Um, and then of course, there's a lot of right whales all along Biscayne Bay and in the Miami area. So, so far as I know, right whales and a dwarf or a pygmy sperm whale. Those are the two I know of. All right. So Sarah Ayers Rigsby would like to know, uh, her question is, she has heard that one of the reasons groups were traveling to Keys was to avoid mosquitoes in the Everglades during the summer. Is there any truth to that? I feel like mosquitoes are terrible in both places. <laughs> um, yeah, so that excerpt that she cited was from Brother Villarreal, who was living at Miami during the 
15, late 1560s into 1570s in Miami area at the Tequesta Mission. And he said, yes, they were avoiding mosquitoes on outlying islands of the Keys. They were leaving the Miami area. And I believe it. I, I think that there's throughout Florida, I think there's surprising areas where there are or are not mosquitoes. Um, another thing he wrote about was his lungs were filling with smoke because the campfires were going so strongly uh, at that time in order to, you know, deflect the mosquitoes or, you know, make things a little bit better. So I believe it that there could be outlying islands that maybe were a, were a haven for them. Okay, so now David Green would like to know, given the opportunity, where would be your dream site to dig at in the Keys and why? Wow, that's a tough one. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is some of the outlying islands west of Key West. Um, I would want to dig there because they could be related to the Key West and Stock Island site because they're nearby and because there's never been any archaeological survey, uh, no formal survey on those islands. So there's the, there's the potential to find very old sites like the ones that I talked about. And there's also the potential to find much more recent sites because um, the Spanish shipwrecks, the Atocha, and so on, they were used as outposts for, for salvage of those ships, some of those outlying islands. And so there's the potential to find 17th century sites that Native Americans and Spaniards and so on were living at while they salvaged those important shipwrecks. So that would be cool. All right, I think that wraps us up on questions for the evening. So a couple more notes before we sign off. Uh, this lecture has been recorded and we will upload it to our YouTube channel and be sharing it via our Facebook page as well. At the conclusion of our program, you all will be prompted to take a brief survey about your experience with tonight's lecture. We value your feedback and would love for you to take a moment to complete the survey. The survey will also be sent in a follow-up email in case you would like to complete it at a later time. That's all we've got for tonight. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we hope you have a great evening. Thank you.